Let's talk about the one, two, threes of curriculum. Hey class, Mr. G here. Welcome back. Today's class, we're going over curriculum. What is, what is it? Why, why do we need it? What's the point? What's the purpose? I'm wrapping up uh, another curriculum writing session for my district. Uh, we, we do a rotating schedule when we rewrite the curriculum, when we restructure it. And I try and get on the team as often as possible because I'm a big, big fan of if you're going to be mandated to do something, might as well be on the team that's helping write it because I want to have my input to what I've got to teach. It's, it's, this is the stuff that I think I want to make, I want to make my life easier and make those who I work with a lot easier. So I always try and get on those teams as much as possible. I also work with all the new teachers in the County so that as new people are coming in, we, we have, I don't want to say we're transient, but we, this is a very transient County in general and new teachers that come in and getting them under the ropes. And so they understand how the district works, what kind of paperwork they have to do, that kind of stuff. Being on the writing committee, I think is a very essential component of that so that as they're coming in, I can tell them, this is why we're doing this. This is what this is for. Uh, so that we're all on the same page and life is just a lot easier. Now getting into the nuts and bolts of how a curriculum is done, there's there are five basic things that we always make sure are covered in the curriculum. And I'm a big fan of like, you teach what you want to teach, but keep this stuff in mind because this makes everything work together better. All right, so starting off, number one, the one thing quintessential to curriculum design is this, know your end game. What is your goal? What is your end game? What is the point of doing this entire curriculum? And uh, I, you know, I was reading through Facebook, I was reading through Facebook and this is why I'm, I'm doing this video is because there's a number of teachers who they have to create a curriculum or write a curriculum or submit a curriculum and they don't know how to do it and they don't know what they're looking for. And these are the five things that kind of gauge a better understanding of how all that stuff is covered. Number one, know your end game. What is the goal of writing this curriculum? What do the kids need to know? What are they going to leave this class knowing? What's the goal? When I was writing for, I've written kindergarten all the way up through seniors and high schools, but they're all different in the way that they go. But we're all talking about kind of a tier or a stacking system. So what you learn in kindergarten should be compounded upon first grade and then second grade and just continue to expand that all the way up through 12th grade in high school with some caveats. I really kind of gauge when we're writing curriculum, the K through fifth grade is one, one structure, middle school six through eight is another structure. And then high school is the weird cousin that came in from out of town because high school is, is different because you have all these different classes. None of them really kind of work together. Yes. I know that 2d and 3d are the building blocks and they raise everything up. I get that. But if you have some kids who don't have, they don't have to take prereq classes and they just jump in a photography class, having those little basics already pre-built in kind of makes everything easier. Again, I know I'm getting kind of jumbled here, but that's how high school works for a lot of us is that the council is like, well, they need this credit. I'm just going to throw them in this class. That's how it works. It's not what we want. It's definitely not what should be done, but you know, we work for the government. They kind of just do what they want. Sometimes knowing an end game, knowing what at the end of the year, every student should do this X, Y, and Z couple basic elements that I think of is the big goal for my sixth grade students was understanding the world at large. So having kind of a taste of everything that existed in um, their own personal identity. So we did a lot of focus on 2D and 3D elements, basic things, uh, elements and principles of art, understanding how color theory works, how basic form structure work. So simple objects that we did. And then in seventh grade, we tied that in with world culture and eighth grade, it became about the U S I think. Um, what, one thing that I found to be a good way to tell your end game is go to your history books, figure out what is in line with the history class, because there's a, there's an easy path to understand of like, you're doing this period and this time of the year, and you're just kind of moving it across. Then you're getting cross connection, curricular instruction, and you're tying everything together, which admin is like, Oh, you're, you're making everything work together. Yeah, we know we, that's like our every day, but sometimes, uh, having that visual representation is really good, which then piggybacks us into the number two there. You want to build for levels one, two, and three. Now one, two, and three is your tier system. Uh, your level one students, the ones who are, uh, they need a lot of help. They don't really, they're not self-starters. They need a lot more structure. Your level twos, they can walk on their own, but they need some guidance and level three, these guys are off and running and you just want to make sure that they don't run off the cliff. Make sure that as you're building your curriculum, you're designing for those three levels in mind. One of the things that I find 
interesting uh, is when I'm building curriculum in the room with other pe other core classes because when we talk when my group talks one two and three we know exactly what that looks like visually in our heads we're like I know what one two and three looks like the other ones it's they got to see a test result and to figure out where kids didn't match up to the standard that they were learning I find it funny that a lot of their level threes, the ones who are like the gifted students, the ones who work above and beyond, they know what they're doing. You throw them in art class, Lord help them. They just don't have it. And it's because they they understand academics, they understand that concept brain structure wise. They, they understand like, all right, these things work together. Got it, let's move on. When it comes to the visual application, they're adding having to add things together. That does not transfer the same way and they get frustrated quickly. And and breaking it down for my students early on, and I do this at the beginning of my lessons in general, is some people don't art the way that they think they can art. And it's a, it's a skill. It's something that you learn over time. You get better at things over time. You don't get on a bike and just start riding it and you are able to compete in the next games competition on that same day. That doesn't happen. You progress over time and you get better at it. Did you not fall down? Yeah, awesome. That just gives you a, a easier time to get to the X Games than the kid who fell down 15 times. The kid who fell down 15 times is not going to be as scared of the big hill and the big ramp because they know how that pain feels. So there's these little nuances that I tell my students and that kind of keeps those building blocks of one, two, and three in mind. That as a designer, when we're doing curriculum, keep that in mind because you want to put those little um, safety measures in there to make sure that all your students are successful at the same day as they get to that end goal. Now, this one is kind of region specific. Make sure this covers everyone and not just where you teach. For where I teach, there is one side of the tracks that is completely different than the other side of the tracks. We understand that that in the curriculum writing in the curriculum team that these kids have leaps and bounds ahead of materials than these kids and it's the same district but money is different so everything that we design for this group has to work in this group and vice versa if you are a smaller group a smaller school that doesn't come into play necessarily you do have to think about kids that are not from there that are coming in are they going to be at the same level what is your expectation again this ties into the first one the end game there are variables at play when you're creating that curriculum that you're going to have people who aren't in the same line of thought as you if you have multiple teachers in, in one school and you're you're just building kind of for your school your your zone you have to be as blanket with your curriculum design as possible you want to make sure that you cover all bases all at once uh, make it broad make it generalized uh, because as soon as you start making it narrow it definitely works against you that's that so let's carry that into that's going to definitely take me into number four which is teach a concept not an artist i'm a big fan of da vinci Renaissance, um, Michelangelo. I'm a big fan of those guys. I am not a big fan, however, of Impressionism art. I like Van Gogh, but I'm not a fan of Monet. I don't like I don't like Impressionism in general. I, it's just, it's a me thing. I, it's a structure thing. I know why they did it. I appreciate it as an art form, but it's just not my taste. With that said, it is important that the students understand why the Impressionistic painters painted the way that they did, and it was for the grasping of light. It was to be that moment, that captured moment. Uh, and there was a specific reason for that art form at that time. This is also the prior to the creation of photography, but it was like at the tail end of uh, Impressionism art where you have photography start to take over because it's changing the art form. And having, the other, and having your students understand the reason behind why these guys painted what they did that is important but it's not important that they have to know who mary cassatt is thing in uh one of one of our design sessions where um one teacher was hardcore she's like we gotta teach about mary cassatt and i'm like why because she was a brilliant uh painter she the way that she blended her colors together the way that she did this i said okay let's go ahead we can talk about blending colors we can talk about the blurriness of line and we can talk about all these different aspects of con concepts reasons why we're doing something that's fine but to say that we have to teach this one artist that's the problem so Make it as broad as possible. That is the key to curriculum design as a whole. And the reason uh, you want to keep it as broad as possible is because of number five, which, and I know I'm kind of jumping through these two really quickly. Don't teach a specific artist because then you're slamming it into one specific thing and you're only teaching about a thing. And you have to guarantee that the student knows exactly what you're teaching about that one artist. And that's all they're going to know. So they're kind of in a little box of not knowing all these other great artists that 
also influences artists, which then is the same issue, which is number five, which is who is this curriculum for? Let's be honest, for the most part, most art teachers in general, we go in doing our own thing as it is, and we just use the curriculum as a really rough guide map of what we might want to be covering in the course of a year. Now, there's some art teachers, there's some teachers in general that use a curriculum for very specific, this is the roadmap, these are the stops that we're going to make along the way, and this is the end result, and that's a fine way to look at curriculum. I've been writing curriculum forever, and I still look at it as, I like how this, I like this big tour, and uh, and these places are fun to stop at. I'm gonna just kind of spend it like 30 seconds here. We're gonna spend a week and a half on this one, because that's the way that I think. That's the way that I, and, and as long as I'm engaged, my students are engaged, and I know that for, for the way that I teach. Think about who this curriculum is for that you're writing for. Is it for yourself or is it for administration? Is it for the people, the powers that be that are, that are that need some sort of a roadmap so they understand why you're doing what you're doing? That's fully understandable, but it's for them. So again, keep it broad, keep it generalized and keep it vague because then you're not going to put yourself in, into a position that is a lot harder to get out of. If I'm doing a drawing unit, I need to focus on line quality. I need to focus on value don't need to focus on really specific reasons as to how we're using a tertillion to blend charcoals together. That's not a necessary thing because then if I have that written down a part of the curriculum and that's what the admin wants to test the students on and they didn't nail that, that idea, that concept, they're going to fail. And then that's going to look bad on me. And that's going to look bad for the admin and the whole curriculum did not do what they wanted it to do. But if I did a generalization that they're showing gradients, they're showing a, a, value scale and they can talk about knowing that there's different grays involved or that there's different shading techniques or there's different shadows. There's a bunch of words that they can do that covers the one thing that they came in to check on. So I kept it broad, I kept it vague, but they still got the answers that they needed to get out of to check the little box and move on. So keep in mind, vagueness is not a bad thing. It usually works in your favor, especially for us. We want to keep a lot of different options on the table and that's a very important thing as you guys are moving forward make sure that you guys keep it uh easy for yourself not difficult that's it that's key so those are my my five must tips for curriculum design i know i didn't really structure a whole lot of you let's let's give a little bonus tip here first through third grade or first through second grade those first three years really focusing on just basic art elements where we're dealing with the elements of art color shape line a little bit of form if you got if you got some time to get some form some some space in there if you can toss those things in there then uh three through five is where you start getting a little more niche where we're going into shading techniques we're going into specific drawing techniques uh again more three-dimensional stuff comes into play how to understand what foreground middle ground background is but again i would not touch that much until sixth grade year and the reason being is because until the age of nine the optical nerve isn't proper, properly developed so the kids can't see shapes in distance in relative distance easily so having them understand that that's kind of a hold off on that after sixth grade sixth grade is yeah just really kind of closing out everything that they got in elementary school so it's the identity identity identifying self in who they are uh then seventh grade I always focus on world cultures world histories because that's what they did in history class eighth grade is more u.s based and they're trying to get back to understanding how the u.s works how america's work and again this is more for the american audience uh and then once you get to high school level then you're getting a lot more niche elements so like what do we want our ninth grade students to, to get out of art in general because most of them it's gonna be an art appreciation class uh visual art one uh art comp whichever whatever term you guys use for it it's all generalized at, once they get through those because you have to have x amount of humanities credits for your in your carnegie units for a high school diploma then after that it bleeds off into the specific structure so we got uh i teach uh surface surface design ceramics photography drawing and painting drawing class painting class animation film studies then there's theater elements depending on if you do a, a performing arts element uh, there's a whole bunch of different things out in the in the in the ether that we could just start going really down the rabbit hole on it helps you f understand what tasks to complete doing a performance task a an object that they're walking away away with rather than just some sort of idea that's always better for me i always like to have something that's tangible the kids can walk away with that that makes understanding of a 
concept a lot easier. Um, most of our most of our kids are hands on learners, and that's not just an art thing. That's an, that's across the board thing. Most most kids that are that I work with in general, it's they would rather hold and manipulate something and do something in that way than just sit there and discuss it and talk about it. Which it's valuable when we do critiques. It's valuable to talk about things, but it's not the the be all end all. So, but I would love to know how you guys handle curriculum. So let's go ahead and toss those things down in the comments. We'll wrap up everything like we always do. Don't forget uh, to like, subscribe, and share all the various platforms. Get the message out there to as many teachers, friends, and students as we possibly can. I want to educate the message, masses, get it all out there for them. If you guys had a question, comment, or concern turned to, during today's class, raise your hands in the comments below. Happy to answer the questions from my classmates. As always, I will see you guys next class. So until then, happy trails and good luck writing. And I'll see you guys next class. Later, guys.